Uh, so welcome back if you've been joining us already. Um, good to see you guys tonight. We are hearing a keynote from Nathan Tinkis um, on the new monetary policy, the latest report that's been put out by Public Money Action. Raul has linked that in the chat. <laughs> if uh, you are interested in reading the full report after the conference. Um, but in the meantime, let me introduce Nathan and then I will hand it off. So in addition to being the publisher of Notes on the Crises, Nathan Tankus is the research director of the Modern Money Network. He has written for the Financial Times, Business Insider, The Guardian, The Appeal, The American Prospect, and JSTOR Daily. His work has also been extensively covered in the Washington Post, Bloomberg, The New Yorker, New York Magazine, Fortune Magazine, Vox, and The New Republic, among other outlets. He was also the subject of a major profile in Bloomberg Business Week, which has made him a sought after speaker and expert on the technical details of monetary policy, central banking, and economic policy more broadly. We are so lucky to have Nathan with us tonight uh, to give his talk. Um, thanks again for agreeing to um, give a talk, Nathan. I appreciate it. Uh, and with that, I will go ahead and give you the floor well obviously uh it's great to be here um, obviously you know part of my bio is the modern money network so obviously i have a deep and long relationship with it and so it's uh good to talk about this report which is uh a long time coming and a product of a lot of thinking and discussions uh among uh people in the modern money network um you know, I've presented this uh, report in a few different places, and um, there's a lot in it. You know, it's over 40 pages, and those are 40 dense pages. Um, so there's many different kind of emphasis that I can put in the on in the report and what's important. And for this audience, which obviously you know it's a modern money network audience, where there are certain conversations that happen among uh, people in the network, uh, I, that I want to emphasize certain components in this report that I wouldn't necessarily uh, kind of spend a lot of time emphasizing elsewhere. Now, a lot of what the core idea, the motivation of this report um, was the recognition that there's a lot of abstract theoretical claims in modern monetary theory, which can be difficult for policymakers to understand and make practically useful in um, designing economic policy. And that doesn't make the, the insights wrong. What that means is um, perhaps different types of uh, rhetoric and different types of intellectual tools are needed to communicate what already is the MMT message. Um, to an economic policy audience, um, and and this is this report is really kind of a core thing to that. So I, I want to you know set the stage a little bit in terms of talking about some sort of general points, which I think are being familiar with people who have a basic familiarity with MMT, and how this report channels those insights. So you know the, obviously core idea um, in MMT is that uh, the federal government um, a an entity with a high degree of, say, monetary agency, uh, uh, as, as um, you know, uh, Will Beeman likes to put it, um, that that kind of entity doesn't need to go find the money somewhere. Uh, it has the money. The question is, what is going to be the economic impact of whatever spending program that, uh, uh, that the federal government engages in? And the... Um, the, so, so in, in thinking in that terms, um, we need a way of articulating what are some potential limits to federal government spending, um, but also what the possibilities are. Um, and in, you know, traditionally in, in MMT discourse, you know, it's talking about how, you know, that as Ron, Ron Gray puts it, there's an infinity sign in the sky, there is, you know, 
this kind of, in some sense, in infinite power to create money. But when you communicate that in policy audiences, lots of misunderstandings emerge from that. And you go, oh, you think you can just spend whatever money and it's fine. That's going to cause hyperinflation and this and that. And the whole uh, conventional discourse um, kind of emerges when you make a correct abstract claim that doesn't um, conceptually fit with how um, co people who think of themselves as practical minded think about the world. Um, so one of the things that this report does and you know comes out of this, this term, which I'll get to in a second, that, that I coined is set some of that material aside and, um, and, and kind of approach things and, and look at the Congressional Budget Office budgeting framework, which of course in a lot of ways we think is deeply flawed, but try to articulate our points in a way that will that make more sense or will be more understandable from a policy uh, uh, view that is so used to engaging the world in a in a CBO way. So rather than just saying all this stuff is nonsense and you that you don't need a pay for, which is not something I'm something I'm saying is wrong, saying it's a different type of rhetoric. Um, the report goes for a different angle rhetorically. That yes, you know, in some sense that we need pay fors. Um, sometimes, not all the time, but in some sense we need pay fors. But that those pay fors and what needs to be quote unquote paid for don't work how you think they work. So we what the pay fors we need are um, things that are going to reduce demand. If we're going to propose some sort of spending program that it can increase demand, obviously in the circumstances where we think that there are a lot of resources being employed and more spending will lead to greater bottlenecks rather than kind of an economy functioning more or at a higher level. Um, and so the term I coined for that is, and, and to emphasize, the space of possibilities that MT opens up is the idea of a non-fiscal paper. So in the normal framework, there are these fiscal papers. You spend a dollar, you need to tax a dollar, and that's it. Um, you know, as, as Stephanie uh, Kelton always talks about, Professor Stephanie Kelton always talks about, um, she encountered in the policy world when she went to the Hill, is if you have a bill and your bill is $100 billion of spending over 10 years, there's a guy you can call in Texas who has bi a binders and binders of possible pay fors And it's not that he's thinking about how the economy functions or is finding you the right pay for for the right type of spending program that you're engaging in. He just has, hey, your spending program is 100 billion over 10 years. What about uh, you know, a 1.05% tax on financial transactions? Um, and that will get you a hundred. We project that'll get you a hundred billion dollars of revenue uh, over ten years. Then your program's quote unquote fully paid for. You don't got to think anymore. Of course, that bill is probably not going to pass anyway. But at least you proposed it the right way. So there's a guy in Texas, and the guy in Texas uh, has these big binders, um, and the, you know, not really anything to do with how the economy works. He just has naively $100 billion of pay fors over 10 years for your $100 billion spending program. And of course, that bill isn't going to pass, but at least you proposed a fully paid for program, quote unquote. Um, the, this alternative uh, approach that uh, the report puts forward is that we do need pay fors, um, again, when the economy is running at a very high capacity. But that these pay fors that we need are, uh, they, they, because they're about demand, they work very differently than naively comparing a dollar of revenue to a dollar of spending. So, you know, first we'll start with taxes and how this, this framework also makes us think differently about taxes. But then we'll go to what I think is the real contribution, which is uh, the non fiscal pay -for. So uh, 
the the in, in in tax terms, when you're looking through this lens, these programs look very different. So you kind of have you, one thing you have to think about are uh uh sorry uh so I got distracted by the chat. Um, one uh, one thing that you have to uh, uh, look look out for is um, what your your spending programs impact on the economy is relative to the taxes. So if you're spending a lot of money, say you know we're proposing a new program for baby formula, um, if your tax if the taxes you're imposing doesn't free up resources to produce for a baby formula, they're not actually working as an offset for the spending programs. And the other thing you have to look out for is what kind of taxes that you're uh, proposing and whether they'll actually do something to help manage the economy. Um, uh, sorry, I do not have uh, slides in this talk. This is just me talking. Um, uh, and so, uh, sorry, I got distracted by that. Um, uh, so, uh, when, so, but, and, and this, this issue of the taxes that you're proposing not being appropriate to managing the economy relative to spending um, is something that comes up a lot, especially in progressive circles. You know, the, for the, the most favored political approach to quote unquote paying for spending among progressives, among center left people is you, met, you propose some big spending program and then you propose some big tax on the rich or some big tax on billionaires. Often, you know, not even some big tax, but a tax that will generate a lot of revenue, even if it won't make much of a difference in terms of how rich those rich people are. And the problem with, with that is it's unclear at best how much tax, those kind of taxes on the rich, especially small, relatively small taxes that don't impact how rich they are, really have an impact on their spending. You can tax a billionaire such that you're collecting you know, $500 billion in, uh, in revenue over 10 years, um, but it can actually not have that big of impact on how much, how much they spend. They could, you know, they could just you know, pay it out of the huge mass of money that they are accumulating. And I'm not necessarily saying that's a, a negative thing or that's going to have a bad thing on the tax end, but it's not doing the, the, the work to free up resources to um, make sure that you can produce more food or, or you know, build ventilation systems for schools in the case of COVID and so on. You know? And so a line that I've often used in this context is you can't uh, break up uh, a yacht and uh, eat the, and feed a whole bunch of people by breaking up the yacht. Um, there's, you know, once we kind of in, in devoted these resources to build those luxury goods, it takes a lot of time to um, reorient resources away from those sectors and towards the sectors that oh, we need it. And that's not gonna function to say, um, uh, offset some spending next year. Uh, but that's kind of, you know, what you might think of as like a negative lens of uh, this view. But what, what we I see is the big positive part, the positive lens for this view is that there's all these non-fiscal payfuls that can reduce demand um, and make room for big spending programs that aren't available in the conventional approach, in the orthodox approach, in the traditional CBO approach. So, you know, the, this report focuses on financial regulation, uh, that there are certain types of financial regulation, financial regulatory tools that we have um, that can serve to um, reduce demand to the economy and thus make room for spending programs. Um, and, you know, in a kind of strange, in, in a strange way, uh, the Orthodox kind of acknowledge this when in the traditional approach, um, it's kind of said, you know, uh, fiscal policy does whatever it wants, and then monetary policy can step in. But the problem is the monetary policy that's stepping in is raising interest rates. 
So this in some sense is they're, they're claiming so on that it's gonna offset things demand wise, but they're not emphasizing that fact. And they're not emphasizing the, what I would see as the non-fiscal pay for elements. Um, but at the same time, when those interest rates increase, uh, or when those interest rates would be projected to increase, if you have a big spending program, then uh, the, what the projection says is, well, interest payments are gonna explode to infinity. Uh, this is fiscally unsustainable. You know, everything is gonna go crazy. And, you know, thus uh, we should just be uh, doing austerity and, you know, monetary policy can clean up things after the fact. Um, and a lot of the uh, a lot of the report is spent focusing in on this issue where they're kind of if you look real closely a semi acknowledgement of the non fiscal pay for point that I'm making but it's obscured because the non fiscal pay for tool that they have is raising interest rates which has this other fiscal effect um, creating more and more interest payments which has in and of itself has an impact on the economy and can make for one of those scary graphs that projects interest rates out to infinity. Um, and so one of the you know, basic points that the report makes, which isn't all the um, possibilities or conclusions that come out of the report, but one basic point is if that monetary policy tool is uh, tightening on financial regulation rather than interest rates, then you don't get that huge um, escalating interest payments effect. All that you get is the offset in demand. And even, even just at that step, um, how economic, macroeconomic policy works looks very differently than it did before you acknowledge these non-fiscal pay um, I, I do also wanna to touch on, because I think it's important in the COVID era and also in the context of climate change, that this isn't the only implication. You know, fi uh, financial regulation isn't the only non-fiscal pay for out there. There's also other non-fiscal pay for And one of the big ones is environmental regulation. You know, certain types of environmental regulation can shut down a factory. And in fact, this gets demagogued all the time. You know, the Green New Deal is gonna clean your job by shutting down some factory or so on. Um, but there's a positive angle to that, which is uh, env tightening environmental regulation in certain specific ways can free up resources that we can devote to building the kind of the kind of things, the kind of green technologies or whatever else uh, the uh, continental electrical grid, for example, um, that we need to uh, transition away from fossil fuels. So there's a big very practical example, which I think needs more work to be done. We need to kind of partner with people with an expertise in environmental regulation to really illustrate and uh, flesh out uh, that there's a possibility for, you know, hey, you cracking down on, on carbon intensive industries and using that as a pay for, for um, Green New Deal spending. Um, the other thing that I would emphasize is that, um, uh, this report started before coronavirus. You know, it was contracted to be written in the middle of 2019. Um, and was so I was working on it and others were working on it before um, coronavirus clearly came into view. And uh, coronavirus itself is kind of a big experiment that illustrates the points that I'm making because um, one way of looking at what happened with coronavirus um, is that we tightened some non-financial regulatory tools. You know, we literally, you know, we shuttered businesses because they're, you know, too dangerous in terms of COVID exposure. We limited uh, indoor capacities. We did all sorts of things that um, limited people's, you know, in a certain sense, um, uh, uh, limited uh, uh, limited uh, spending that people could do um, uh, by you know limiting half, uh, what activities they could go out and do, and that you know that led to a huge contraction of the economy. Now, obviously, that isn't my ideal um, 
implementation of those kind of that kind of program. I would, for example, uh, uh, per, uh, prefer milder uh, health, health regulations in, imposed in advance so that we can get we can get ahead rather than being behind of huge outbreaks. But nonetheless, it does provide a kind of test case example for what I'm talking about about how powerful um, uh, non-fiscal non pay for is, how powerful non-financial regulations and uh, financial regulations can be in terms of having a big demand effect. Um, uh, and that's that's a huge example. Now, obviously, climate is uh, the coronavirus example isn't an ideal example of the implementation of that kind of thing. But you know, you don't have to go full hog with say, you know, uh, kind of a full shutdown, quote unquote, to get to see some benefits from um, managing demand through tightening environmental, uh, uh, say, environmental regulations. Um, you can tighten much milder than a kind of sudden shutdown and still see a demand benefit that would then be offset by a fiscal policy. And the coronavirus is also an example of that. You know, I put in the report, I put this in terms of non-fiscal pay fors but you can also put this in terms of fiscal offsets to um, non-fiscal programs. You know, we had this huge um, set of health regulations that need, needed to be imposed in order to clamp down on COVID, and we needed to offset the demand effect of those uh, health regulations with expansionary fiscal policy. And at least in 2020 and early 2021, that is what we did. Um, and, you know, we can, I'm not going to get into kind of the most recent current events and we can argue about um, the current, uh, the current quote unquote inflation that's happening. We can argue about whether, you know, there was an overshooting in uh, with uh, the last fiscal program in early 2021. But the, the basic essential point that, uh, you, that uh, contractionary non-financial uh, non-financial regulation and non-fiscal pay fors going along with huge fiscal programs were able to at least roughly balance each other, even if we think one, even if some might argue one a little bit overshot the other. It's a it's a test example from a, a very uh, fast paced and chaotic crisis time that shows us. That gives us an example, a pathway of thinking about policy on a longer, more planned, more controlled timeline, say a decade plan for decarbonizing the economy. Um, and, and, and so I, I want to emphasize that as even though it's something that something the report really focuses on, it's a logical extension from the report that I think is, uh, is very important to talk about and to think about, and I'm hoping to bring some people in interested in that kind of work uh, in the future. And uh, so that's, you know, that that's kind of, this kind of set of intersecting issues are like the core issues that I think are important for a modern money network audience or friends of modern money network audience um, to be thinking about the report and coming on uh, further from the report. You know, the report, focuses, you know, a lot of the report is focusing on the details of financial regulation because it's it's easy to say, well, uh, financial regulation can offset some big spending program, um, but that's a lot easier said than done. You know, the, que the questions are what financial regulations, how effective are they able to, uh, you know, manage demand? How much can they be targeted and manage demand and managing demand and what are the best tools and how do those tools fit in with our goals for financial stability? And that is uh, a lot of what the report is focused on. And frankly, is a lot of what made the report so hard to write is dotting all those I's and, and crossing all those T's. Um, and, but I think that those kind of issues, if you're very interested in those kind of, those kind of details can be gotten for the report. For, for, for an MNT audience, I think, this um, it's this bro these broader issues that are important about a kind of different rhetorical angle to 
uh, engaging in economic policy debates and bringing M core MMT insights, which I think the report does, um, to those conversations and making them more and more operationable, operationable from an economic policy standpoint. Um, that's kind of the meat of what I what, what I have um, to talk about, what I, what I was thinking in terms of talking about. So I, I'm going to spend the last little bit of this um, talking about one further implication, which is in one way a niche implication, but in one way, I think a huge and broadly important implication of the framing of the report, and that is uh, reparations. Things like reparations for slavery, which obviously, you know, I'm not going to get into um, the politics of, of those kinds of topics here, but I do want to emphasize um, the intellectual implication that uh, at the, you know, from that same viewpoint where we're no longer naively comparing a dollar of spending to uh, a dollar of taxes and instead looking at the impact of, this, of the spending or the taxes on the economy, uh, it gives us an opportunity to uh, uh, really uh, in, uh, impacting uh, of that conversation and that debate. You know, big numbers get thrown around in the reparations debate. Trillions of dollars numbers get, th get thrown around. Um, and uh, most of the arguments uh, for reparations being unrealistic are premised on how big those dollar amounts are. But one of the interesting things when you examine reparations is um, not all programs, but a lot of the programs for reparations, they're specifically aimed at asset purchases. They're aimed at buying land, they're aimed at buying real estate, they're aimed at um, buy, uh, buying out businesses, some of them at least, um, and transferring of those businesses in some shape or form. Obviously, there's a lot of different models for how reparations would work, but in some shape or, shape or form, transferring um, ownership and or control of those businesses uh, to African Americans uh, or Black people more generally, which is a debate I'm not going to get into because it's not that's 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 not a debate that that I uh, have relevant uh, insight or expertise in. But regardless of whichever model you're looking at, it's these kind of models that are focusing on the acquisition of wealth rather than the provisioning of income. Often programs have, often reparations programs have some component that's about income, but many programs, not all, but many programs are focused on the transfer of control of wealth and. When you look at it from that point of view, that potentially the vast majority, if not all, of what a reparations program would be, would not be directly injecting income into the economy um, or, or direct spending on current goods and services, but would be uh, the purchase of assets that would have indirect impacts on uh, current spending, then reparations programs uh, look a lot different than uh, you might otherwise think. One, one way of putting it would be, you know, a $10 trillion reparations program, say over 10 years, so that's trillion dollars a year, but if most of that is being, or the vast majority of that is being devoted by, to buying assets, then only a small percentage of that dollar amount will actually um, come into current spending, you know, just to you know, this obviously would take a lot of empirical work, estimations to put up to a specific number, but let's say, just for sake of argument, that you had $10 uh, of, of reparations money, and that was only going to generate a dollar of income, because most of it went to buying assets and transferring assets, which will have effect uh, over on, on income over a much longer time horizon, then a trillion dollars a year can potentially look like a hundred billion or a two hundred billion uh, dollar program in terms of how much, how many offsets or uh, uh, pay fors that we need, whether they be fiscal pay fors or non fiscal pay fors. And from that point of view, 
these programs, which are often dismissed as completely fiscally unfeasible or, or so on, um, suddenly look a lot more, uh, a lot more fee uh, feasible. Uh, and that I think is, is an important, is another important, hugely important implication, uh, regardless of, you know, the, obviously the politics of reparations are very fraught, but I think it, it is an important um, example that shows how different the world can look from an MMT lens and also has a policy relevance um, to the to those conversations. Now, obviously, there are lots of different objections to reparations um, on top of fiscal objections, but um, fighting the fight on fiscal objections can kind of uh, push the argument back to these foundational philosophical uh, arguments over reparations and kind of get us back to kind of brass tacks. And I think it's also just in general, it's an important example that shows how the MMT lens um, can make us, it can help us think about things differently. And this is also an area that I'm interested in and actually do plan to co-author uh, in the future uh, a, a paper or some, something equivalent to that. On that topic, coming out of the framework and the, the way of looking at uh, and economic policy that the report lays out and uses financial regulation as an example. And I think I think that's uh, that's where I'll pause and let uh, let Hannah take over managing Q and A if we do have questions. Thanks again, Nathan, for um, coming tonight and and talking about the report. I appreciate that it was tailored to. Our audience specifically, I know the report is um, full of technical language and it would have been very easy to, to get bogged down in all of that. So your ability to, to translate for us is um, greatly appreciated. Um, I will, let's see. I don't know if there are any explicit questions in the chat, um, but I was uh, wondering if you could, talk a little bit more about, you mentioned um, some writing that needs to be done on environmental regulations as a non-fiscal pay for for Green New Deal spending. And that definitely seems like a great um, avenue for future work. Um, do you mind talking a little bit more about what other places you see sort of the non-fiscal pay for framework being useful um, as we sort of like move you know, move forward from here in the, the wake of Corona? Yes. Um, so, uh, I, I'm, I mean, I think coronavirus is a complicated, um, complicated to think about in terms of implications for ongoing coronavirus policy because um, I mean, we can't get the very basics of coronavirus policy um, implemented in the United States right now. I mean, we are in the midst of another coronavirus wave, which basically is not being responded at all um, by policymakers. So it's, um, it's kind of tough to think about kind of wanting to dive into policy relevant work um, right now about coronavirus and what would be a useful intervention from our point of view when um, it, it seems impossible to get even the basics um, done. But I, I think there definitely is uh, and things that can be written about, I think, uh, implications to be had. Um, but I, uh, I don't know, it, it's, it's hard for me to think about what would be good to say if you started a summer project and had something out next year, like what would be something that would be of relevance that would have impact. Um, maybe something input output wise, but that would probably involve, like, say, a graduate student at UMKC who's very interested in uh, input ac uh, output economics. Um, I think, in terms of other implications, obviously, no, I think, you know, for me, from my point of view, it's like we've got financial regulation, which there's more can definitely be done from the framework that the report lays out. Um, environmental regulation is a big thing. I think regulations is, is a big example. I think student debt is another example. I think student debt um, is an example similar to reparations where the dollar amount sounds very big 
and that drives a lot of the conversation, but the actual demand impact of um, doing uh, of of doing student debt in terms of the full dollar amount um, uh, is it wouldn't be very big. And so there's kind of something similar, although on a smaller scale, um, to the rep reparations work that can also be done for student debt cancellation. So that would be one other area and, and, and very relevant because uh, student debt uh, can be canceled by uh, uh, by the Department of Education until the Supreme Court says that uh, administrative agencies don't exist anymore. Um, but then we have other problems in terms of implementing economic policy. Um, I'm gonna, yeah, okay. I think so. I think that's what I would go there. And then I think we've gotten a bunch of questions since then. So <laughs> we can pick up one of yeah. those. I appreciate that. So Raul asked, um, it seems like we're not in the right moment for all of the applications of the report. What sort of controls or regulations do you think would be useful both now and later in the context of fiscally expansive industrial policy? Um, also, is there space in this policy vision for regulating non-financial corporations that engage in predatory pricing or aim for low prices outside of gouging? Yeah, I mean, I don't think this, I don't think non-fiscal papers really hit those topics. I mean, I think there's just, um, there's price regulation to work, relation to work related to coordination rights and safety to Paul's work. Um, obviously, Fred Lee um, and Gardner Means are touchstones in this area. I think it's just a, it's a little bit of a different um, area to look at. I think the one place that is relevant, um, and I actually had some stuff written in the report, it was just, you know, the report is already a lot. So it ended up having to be cut within at the last like final month of working on it on the report was thinking about financial regulations that would have an impact on competition law and have an impact on market structure. So, you know, say, um, financial regulations, which make it harder to engage in mergers uh, would be uh, something that would be of relevance. Um, changing the structure of the banking system um, in terms of the balance between large banks and small banks is something that would um, probably um, make big business less competitive, quote unquote, relative to smaller businesses. Um, uh, I, so those are kind of examples where financial regulation can step in. Um, I think, uh, but but in general, I, I think I think you know non-fiscal pay fors and the report covers a lot, but it's not everything in the economic policy space. Of course, in the report we do talk about say uh, a finance a, a, a price stability oversight council, which I think is a really good idea and would uh, has has is relevant to. Um, the, to manage the uh, the parts of pricing and prices and uh, full employment that aren't directly related to um, spending and uh, spending related bottlenecks. So that's that's an element from the report, but that rep that element in the report is really um, foreshadowing other more systematic work. Awesome, thank you. Um... We also um, sort of circling back a little bit to the reparations topic. Uh, Mauricio is asking on the reparations topic, wouldn't the money that's spent on buying assets be used eventually by the sellers of those assets and effectively injected into the economy? Yeah, um, so that's yeah. yes, but that is from the, from the point of view of managing the, uh, the macro economy, that's fine. So for example, you buy a business from some white businessman or a group of white businessmen, and you put it under control of, say, predominantly black employees. Just as an example, um, that businessman, you know, let's say he's been working on building that business, or, or been, you know, owner of that business, and that business has been growing for, say, 25 years or so. Probably is in his 50s, maybe in his 60s. Um, the the his equity in his business is most likely, more likely than not, his retirement plan. Um, you know, maybe he has some social security, but more than likely, he, you know, to live on the lifestyle that he's accustomed to, what he's selling his business for is his 
um, is uh, his is his uh, you know life savings. Um, you know maybe as a result of the reparations program, he gets a bigger capital gain than he was expecting. You know maybe he thought he could sell his business for four hundred fifty thousand, he could sell it for five hundred twenty-five thousand, whatever it is. Um, but that it's not like he's gonna you know go spend the whole amount immediately. You know he's probably gonna put it into some annuity. Um, some other way of providing himself a steady income and live on it for the, the rest of his life. You know, maybe there are some people who are going to go out and spend it all um, immediately and have a direct immediate impact on the economy. But at the macro level, more likely than not, most of the people who are getting bought out um, at or above their kind of book value of the business um, that becomes a nest egg for the future rather than something they're going to, you know, go and blow it off. In the same way that inheritance in the economy generally isn't this huge inflationary thing where someone inherits um, uh, wealth and then blows it all immediately. You know, wealth begets wealth. Generally, people who, are, uh, who have wealth and inherit wealth, they are trying to sustain wealth for next generation or for their old age. And um, as a result, at the aggregate level, comparing, you know, sending out, say, $1,000 checks to every household to the equivalent amount of money buying out businesses and changing the control of those businesses, you're generally going to see a lot less spending in the economy from buying out businesses um, than just sending people checks because it has a much less direct impact on incomes in the economy. Um, that's the intuition behind that idea. And I think the evidence you have for uh, asset purchases, even you know, equity in a business purchases uh, versus direct um, increases to people's disposable income bears that out, that it's not directly stimulated. You're right, it'll have a spending impact over a longer horizon, but 10, 15, 30 years spending impacts those are much easier to manage on an economic policy basis. I mean, we might be in a recession in 13 years and not have to do any offset or at all. Whereas you're going to need to do some sort of offset if you're spending a trillion dollars this year. Awesome, thank you. Um, we also had a little conversation about the, it looks like Chris Small's hearing at the Senate Budget Committee, if you want to comment on that briefly, but also um, Betty's asking about what the implications of non-fiscal pay for us would be uh, for something like a jobs guarantee as well. Um, so the implications aren't direct, they're um, indirect, you know, as, as we often talk about, the job guarantee, legally enforceable right to a job, is a fiscal automatic stabilizer, which means that um, when the economy is doing good, automatically this program becomes smaller because less people are employed in the job guarantee, so the program is spending less. And when there's a recession, more people come into the program, and thus the program is spending more. So it spends less when the economy is good and more when the economy is bad. That makes it counter cyclical that makes it an automatic fiscal stabilizer because no one has to go out there and pass a new spending bill to get the job guarantee more funding as it's proposed by many different advocates, but also us. Um, it's an automatic program. You know, you just have a legally enforceable right to a job and as a result of uh, the spending uh, adjusts. It's a, it's a mandatory, uh, mandatorily funded program. Um, in that context where you have that kind of additional automatic fiscal stabilizer, um, it does two things. Uh, the stronger automatic fiscal stabilizers are, um, the more essentially mistakes you can make. When you overshoot in an economy in how much you can spend, how much you spend relative to what the economy can handle, in an economy with no automatic fiscal stabilizers, um, the economy can just continues going in the wrong direction. And you see this in certain kinds of economies, like say 18th century North American colonies, 
um, that when they launch some sort of spending program and they're balancing it with taxes, they don't balance it say we have an income tax, they balance it with specific taxes dollar for dollar. And they're not doing that um, for the CBO reasons, they're doing that because they don't have the kind of fiscal system that can automatically adjust to the state of the economy. So they kind of have to discretionarily respond to what's happening in the economy as it happens. And that's easy to overshoot or undershoot, you know, suddenly have some big, you know, you know, run up in inflation or some big depression because the fiscal system doesn't adjust. But now we have things like a graduated income tax, things, potential things like a job guarantee um, and other sorts of programs, unemployment insurance, which are automatically adjusting systems in the sense that you don't need to pass some new bill for, the, for, the, for them to adjust as they do. They, they respond to the economic cycle. They respond to overall income all, all on their own. And so because of that, you can make mistakes. You overshoot. Um, you spend more than the economy can really handle. And when you have very strong fiscal automatic stabilizers, tax revenues go up, these other spending programs go down, and the economy adjusts. You know, maybe it takes some time for the economy to be able to absorb uh, you deciding to spend the wrong amount of money, but it's a lot easier. I would say we do have fiscal automatic stabilizers in the United States, but we also have other programs that spending goes up when the economy is better and it goes down when the economy is worse. Um, so I would say overall, our fiscal system is only mildly countercyclical um, on an automatic basis. Obviously, we have these discretionary programs that launch that people scramble together in a crisis, like happened with the CARES Act in April 2020. But um, the, in terms of just what automatically happens, not very strong. And you know, to kind of put those guardrails up to, uh, we need stronger automatic fiscal stabilizers. The job guarantee is part of that. I think the other thing that the job guarantee does is it makes it easier to reallocate workers from different types of activities um, because you because the, rather than kind of trying to find people who are unemployed, you can just show up and find people who are in the job guarantee program, um, and it makes coordinating those kinds of activities a lot easier. So I think that's a second way in which the job guarantee is, is, is relevant. Um, but as I said, it's an automatic fiscal stabilizer. So um, it's not directly relevant to just the, our discretionary decisions, which is really what um, non-fiscal pay fors and, and you know, big spending programs are about in the context of this report. It's about, this is about what you, how you balance spending when you pass a bill in Congress. Awesome. That makes a lot of sense. Um, Raul asks in the chat, what's the goal of applying financial regulations to dirty firms? Are the regulations supposed to kill fossil fuel companies, euthanize them, push them to other business activity? Um, i.e., what is the expected impact? Uh, I think that's uh, something that needs to be designed and structured in the program. Um, I would say, you know, it's important to emphasize that um, non-financial companies, they are a legal entity and they have all sorts of assets, financial, non-financial, and they're a set of physical plants, physical establishments, and often a network of these physical establishments. Usually they're, you know, for tons of multinational corporations, there are dozens or hundreds of physical establishments. So um, depending on how you design a program, um, there are certain things that in the question that Rawls positing are, are posited as uh, differing objectives, but can be consistent with each other if we distinguish the, um, the, the corporate entity from individual plans. So our, you know, for example, one approach could be, we are gonna target um, the plant, the dirtiest plants, the, the, the the, uh, the oldest plants, the ones that are having the most emissions, and we could be, our plan in applying certain regulations, whether they're environmental regulations or non-financial, but I think not, environmental regulations would be better suited to this, 
um, are aimed at shutting down those specific plants and redirecting the resources that go to those plants to other more activities that we think are more useful and specifically more useful for the green transition. But while that is a financial hit to um, whatever corporate entity or company that we're talking about, it isn't necessarily our goal to say, you know, bankrupt or put that company into receivership. We could just be, you know, shifting that along and that business can enter other businesses. They can read the writing on the wall for our program and go, well, we need to, you know, get much more into wind turbines or whatever else. So um, I think um, these tools are very flexible and we can go for various different um, different goals, but it doesn't necessarily have to be, oh, you know, we just got to kill all the uh, fuel company uh, in that way. It can be specifically aimed at uh, specific uh, uh, dirty plants or simply um, in the financial regulatory tool sense, simply um, decreasing their ability to finance new investment. I mean, we can just be pushing them to investing less and over the long term, that will shrink the, relative, the size of these businesses relative to the rest of the economy, relative to green businesses and so on. Uh, I mean, so we'll, we'll wait a moment for other questions. Uh, I'll take the opportunity to say, um, you, know, you can imagine I'm somewhat busy today, but if you do have further questions or inquiries related to the report, you can email me at crisisnotes uh, at gmail.com. Uh, my, my email is also uh, at my website, crisisnotes.com. And I'll also, yeah, and uh, then when, uh, account has that in the chat, so you can reach me there and uh, uh, with further questions related to this or, you know, inquiries about giving a talk or whatever else uh, is, is, is on your mind. I can't promise you that I'll be able to get back to you in a timely manner, but, um, you know, that option is, is available to you. Awesome. Thank you so much for uh, being willing to make yourself available for, for further questions. Um, Raul famously, uh, from Public Money Action, um, our sort of political outreach uh, organization, um, asks what have been the most common follow-up questions in your uh, experience from policymakers specifically, who I think is more um, of the audience that the report is aimed for? Um, I think it's, uh, we've still been in, in the process of that. I think for a lot of people, a lot of what I was talking about was very new, and I think people find it useful. Um, but there's nothing specifically comes to mind as kind of like a common default question. I mean, I think we have had some questions about well, a lot of questions is what can be done right now. What's an easy kind of off the shelf bill that we could approach? Um, and I and there you know questions what you could do with. Um, current administrative agency discretion, meaning like not having to pass a bill in Congress. Um, and uh, the kind of answer, my, my answer, especially on financial regulatory tools, is that there's insights that can be taken from the report for current monetary policy and can be done without changing the laws, but um, to really kind of have a shift in framework of that that the report suggests it probably does require legislation. Um, Michael Brennan says, any thoughts on the Stable Act as an application of non-fiscal pay-fors uh, or other PMA policies? Um, I think Stable Act is, again, it's, it's, it's kind of an infrastructural thing. It's about our payment system. And I don't think um, there's necessarily anything that, that directly um, implies for uh, has implications like for example i don't think it's going to have uh an impact on demand directly um I, it does make building certain kind of automatic fiscal stabilizers uh easier to implement or trigger-based stabilizers uh easier to implement so for example um if you have if every person has an e-wallet account that they have access to um that is a direct account with the government where um, dig digital fiat currency can be deposited, it makes a lot better to, it makes it a lot easier to send 
thousand dollars to everyone. Um, the, the IRS had had to do that for the stimulus checks uh, from the CARES, from the CARES Act and for later bills, and that has a famously um, was a famously fraught effort. Um, was obviously means tested uh, in terms of means tested in a light way in the sense of your determined your 2019 income determined it, but that determination was made on their side. You didn't have to like fill out a bunch of paper for it. But um, those kind of things will be simplified and thus, you know, work better as fiscal automatic stabilizers. You know, for example, if you and unemployment insurance can be this way. Unemployment insurance can be potentially directly deposited uh, by the federal government into um, a, a digital wallet. Um, and that would supersede a lot of the payment system issues we've had with state administered um, unemployment insurance. So um, th th it's those kind of examples where at the, um, at the administrative capacity level, the stable in, uh, act has implications, um, but I don't think it has direct implications of demand, but I, I defer to Raul and Rowan that they might have conceptualizations of the bills um, and their direct impact of demand that um, don't occur to me off the cuff. Yeah, PayPal is an example. Uh, it, 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 you know, wh what happens when you make regulate PayPal and regulate PayPal balances? Uh, uh, potentially that could have an impact in terms of how it shifts around, how those assets are managed. So I was just going to suggest, I mean, further to Nathan's point, I think if we're talking about reaching all kinds of companies in terms of managing demand pressure, the world is certainly going to look different in, you know, by the time we would have the power to implement this kind of program. What's going to be needed between now and then is understanding how much, um, you know, dirty fossil fuel companies, but anybody else we want to regulate relies on this tech structure um, to manage their own businesses. And so we'd really be talking about an indirect way of getting at these companies. I don't know what that looks like yet, though. So not not particularly helpful there. But Michael, you also raised the question. I've never thought about it before. So <laughs> I'm all ears there as well. Michael, I don't know if that is a joke, but I have actually seriously brought that up as a point in several of my lectures over the course of this past semester. So I appreciate seeing it in another context. <laughs> I mean, that is a dirty industry. Uh, <laughs> Amen. All, all these, we've got a lot of tech components that are in short supply actually right now and caught in bottlenecks and fucking Elon keeps buying like equipment we need to save the planet. So actually this is probably way more real than I first gave it credit for. Sweet. So yeah, feel free to put questions in the chat or um, hop on audio and uh, just unmute yourself um, to ask questions. Um, this is a great question. Yes, all of the recordings of these conference sessions will be made available um, at the end of the conference. Uh, they'll be posted on the Modern Money Network's YouTube channel where you can find also uh, recordings of previous conferences as well. Um, and we're very, we're very excited to be able to make stuff available. Um, big thanks to Alexander uh, for doing the tech work to, to make that happen for us this year. So Nathan, you did get another question um, asking you to briefly touch on uh, how higher interest rates uh, might lead to pricing pressures via the interest income channel. And also, yes. if you want to explain what that means. Uh, yeah, so the interest income channel is just, it, it's actually very simple. It's just the idea the Federal Reserve raises interest rates. As a result, people who invest in bonds or other interest bearing assets are suddenly going to get more interest income. Um, you know, and, and then in terms of the question, um, you know, this is kind of an, an issue that can be kind of complicated because there are various countervailing factors. It's unambiguous. People get more interest income, their income is higher, they spend more. That, you know, is uh, leads to more spending, you know, on its own can have a uh, put pressure on prices. The countermelling effect is that when you raise interest rates, um, the amount that 
people in debt, especially private debt, uh, pay an interest goes up and their disposable income, if you kind of consider how much they have to uh, pay in interest as subtracting from their disposable income, leads their disposable income to go down. So there's one group where disposable income is going down and there's another group where disposable income is going up. Um, then there's the third complication, which is when interest rates first rise, bond prices go down. So, pe so people who uh, hold, hold bonds, um, especially long um, bonds that mature uh, far into the future, take this immediate hit to their wealth uh, when interest rates go up. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of can be kind of complicated. These are the three main factors and this other we can touch on. Um, but these three main factors, figuring out what their balance is. I would say, and you, you know, this isn't, you know, I haven't done a deep statistical analysis. So take this with the grain of salt that it should be taken with. But um, in our current economy where levels of private debt are still relatively high um, and uh, the and with that immediate impact of um, people being on paper less wealthy because interest rates have gone up, that um, the interest income channel in our current economy um, would be smaller than those other effects. Um, but if you know interest rates got really high and say you had a whole bunch of people who just started defaulting on their private debt, that interest income channel could get really big relative to those other channels. Um, and certainly if, and if, if, you, if it goes on long enough, the longer time goes on, the more that kind of interest income channel can win out. But I don't think in the immediate term, we can think, oh, interest rates are going up. That's gonna be um, overall a source of price pressure with these kind of counter, uh, countervailing um, uh, issues. But there are certainly certain times and places where it can be the dominant effect, where the levels of private debt are far lower in the economy. Um, the, the wealth effect is uh, less important. There's a lot less people holding long maturity bonds. They mostly hold short maturity bonds or whatever the equivalent in other types of interest bearing assets. Um, um, so there can be times and places where the effect is bigger. I've seen some arguments for like early 90s Italy being a place where um, that effect was relatively much bigger. Um, you can make an argument for posts for like the decade after um, the big financial crash in Japan in the early 90s is a, is a time and place where that uh, might have applied. But I don't think in our current economy, um, the interest income channel, basically people holding interest bearing assets, getting more interest income would be the um, place where that would win out. Yeah, maybe it's a good moment to discuss the eliminating the Fed's discretion over interest rates and how you'd want to pivot around that. <laughs> yes. Um, but, and this is one of the things that the report hits that from my point of view, and I, I kind of said it in the talk, but I'll, I'll reemphasize it here, where I think that the ability for the Federal Reserve to raise interest rates is most problematic is um, the ideological impact it has on fiscal policy. And you can kind of see that right now. In a, in a scenario with the Federal Reserve's tightening, you know, fiscal policy, which, you know, the argument for fiscal, for expansionary fiscal policy, for using fiscal policy to manage the economy, had gotten a lot stronger since uh, the coronavirus uh, depression. Um, the Fed's tightening and that kind of, that slammed all of those arguments, shut the door on a lot of those arguments, which was what I was afraid of and why was the original impetus for writing the report is I could sense we're going to potentially very, very strong possibility we're going to be in a situation where the Federal Reserve feels the need to raise interest rates and all these arguments that are premised on low interest rates will then shut the door on expansionary fiscal policy. And unfortunately, I think that instinct was right about what that impact would be. Um, and so, you know, the, the corollary is that the report, by emphasizing these non-interest rates, financial regulatory tools that can be managed in the economy is emphasizing we at the very least don't need to use interest rates as much as we do 
but we can also just not use interest rates at all. So the kind of maximum program, the Green New Deal program, as it were, in the report, as opposed to kind of the minimal program or the Built Back Better program in the report, um, is uh, just saying, no, the Federal Reserve can't raise interest rates, can't, um, you know, have bond, have government bonds that are going to be paying higher interest rates. They have to, you know, there's a ceiling to the interest rate target that they can hit. You know, maybe that ceiling should be zero. We kind of make the strongest argument from the report, but it doesn't really matter if it's zero or 2% or 3% or just as long as they can't raise interest rates to 8, 9, 10, 20%. And once you put that maximum cap to how much the Federal Reserve can raise interest rates, um, first of all, they're going to need to use other tools to manage the economy, like financial regulatory tools, like fiscal policy tools, like stronger automatic fiscal stabilizers. But second, you're by construction ruling out um, the uh, ruling out uh, those those CBO charts where interest rates explode to into infinity. You know, the the C, the Congressional Budget Office is supposed to follow current law and not simply assume that the law is going to change in making its forecast. So if current law says that interest rates can't be raised, that that government interest pay, uh, interest rates interest rates on government IOUs, whether it's money in the bank at the Fed or uh, government securities or savings bonds um, can't rise, say, above 3% interest or 1% interest, whatever, then by construction, the CBO can't, in its forecast, project that interest rates are going to rise above their, st their statutorily mandated level, and thus they can't produce those scare charts where interest uh, payments become 60% of the economy. Ron in the chat says CBO FinReg assessments are particularly terrible. Yeah. Um, thanks again, Nathan, for coming and uh, talking to us this evening and answering questions. I really appreciate it. Um, and oh, I didn't realize Matt was, I, I do want to shout out Matt. I didn't realize the that he was listening. Um, but Matt is who I am going to co-author on um, reparations and non-fiscal papers, essentially. Um, and so, you know, shout him out and someone to watch on that topic as we you know we circle back to that uh, that uh, that after a few years of not working on it. So, yeah. absolutely, I um, cannot emphasize enough how excited I am for that. That's very, um, very exciting. Also, uh, come see Matt on our panel tomorrow about social provisioning and movement strategizing um, at 1 p.m. EST, uh, along with David Stein and Jordan Ayala and uh, moderated by Alexander Van Monstrieu. Um, that's going to be a ton of fun. I'm very excited uh, for that panel. Thank you guys again all for coming out. Um, Events.modernmoneynetwork.org, I believe, is where you can register for either tomorrow's event or next week's event on debt forgiveness, where we will be talking about uh, tons of different aspects of debt, including uh, the cancellation of student debt. That's very exciting. Um, and next Saturday, the 28th at 1 p.m., join us for a conversation with Stephanie Kelton. Um, very excited for that as well uh, for the end of our conference series this year. So, yeah, thanks again, everybody, for coming out, and we'll see you hopefully tomorrow. <laughs>